Welcome back, everybody. Um, I hope you enjoyed lunch and the poster session. And we will continue our program. So it's uh, really nice that I'm able to present uh, Patricia Schulzen. She's from the Fraunhofer Institute for Solar Energy Systems, and she's a group leader there at the um, Novo Solar Cell um, Concepts Group. She's been working on perovskite silicon tandem solar cells now for six years. And she has uh, just gotten a new record cell of 26.8%, which she will talk to us about, and uh, mainly been working on uh, the position techniques of perovskites on uh, textured silicon, but also surface preservation strategies, high band gap perovskites, um, and other concepts that we will hear about um, now. So please let's welcome Patricia. Hello everyone, thank you Vinko, for the introduction. Um, I'm very happy to be here, so first thank you very much uh, to the organizing team. Uh, it's an honor um, to present uh, some of our results today. I'm Patricia Schulze um, and I have uh, the pleasure to present some of our work on monolithic two terminal perovskite silicon tandem solar cells um, from our work at Fraunhofer ESE, which is in Freiburg in Germany and actually yeah, the biggest um, uh, solar Research Center in Europe. Uh, we have uh, around 1,400 employees, uh, so quite impressive as it spans over really um, yeah, processing but also levelized cost of electricity, all of these topics we heard in the morning and actually also doing policy. Um, we, we really focus on the whole system also on batteries and, and the whole uh, energy system in total. So um, yeah, in our uh, group we focus on perovskite silicon tandem solar cells and we have different activities at Fraunhofer ESE and um, today I've chosen that it might be maybe nice for you to um, pick out and hear about actually the interplay between simulation characterization and processing and our topsoil optimization and how actually yeah, we you need to use it interlinked to actually improve um, our devices. But first I want to briefly introduce the topic to you. Um, I'm not sure if everyone is also familiar with the Roth's Guide actually, but I guess you've heard about it uh, as a new hot topic here yeah, also in PV. But um, yeah, first I've just chosen two, two main uh, um, snapshots here from some papers. Uh, but actually in the previous talk we heard actually about the whole uh, big challenge we are facing. Um, it's clear that we uh, also in the European Union want to reach uh, within the Green New Deal the net uh, zero uh, greenhouse emission by 2050 and uh, this means there's a huge challenge but on the other hand like PV just made such a huge progress uh, we saw that the price is uh, at a very low level and uh, it's competitive um, to other technologies and we will need to go and really face this big challenge we do have that we actually need to go into the terawatt scale also with photovoltaics and that actually this uh, technology is a key energy conversion technology for the future um, of our global energy system. And uh, there are also two uh, yeah, challenges, uh, I mean also for other technologies but also two for PV, um, that we need to reduce the costs for sure and uh, also the, the resource consumption. And actually these two big challenges we can tackle by addressing uh, to increase the power conversion efficiency of um, our photovoltaic technology. Because I mean it was also mentioned in the, in the previous talk that actually the module itself is so cheap uh, it's just a very low fraction of, of the whole cost to get for example a PV on your rooftop and uh, uh, yeah, the balance of system also everything uh, except the module actually is making a good portion. But if you can imagine increasing the efficiency of the device, you need the same amount of other frame. If there's one, there is the same amount for the installation and, and all the, the organization to get it on the rooftop, uh, but a higher power output. So it's a very important leverage, and that is uh, actually what we've been working on in the PV community um, anyway, or for in, in the past and also uh, here I just uh, brought like a graph showing the average cell conversion efficiency of 
the silicon-based technology, which is dominating the market, uh, the, the production is like 95% uh, just silicon-based, so it's more or less uh, the, the, the technology ruling. And you see that uh, we had a great improvement, this is actually now for mass production, driven of course by the, by the research, uh, the great research which was done, um, improving the um, efficiency by around 1.6% absolute uh, annually. Um, however, there's a little problem, there's a <laughs> the fund, uh, fundamental efficiency limit uh, for these solar cells and these arise um, as you know, you have a certain band gap of the material and all the photons which have lower energy, um, they cannot be absorbed, uh, they, they are lost as transmission and for higher energy photons, we lose some of, um, of the energy due to uh, thermalization losses. And yeah, our answer to this and how to proceed is to actually go to tandem solar cells. And um, here, the concept is uh, simple, that you just stack another absorbent material, in this case with a uh, wider band gap on top of silicon, to actually reduce the thermalization losses. In the end, you see the solar spectra uh, spectrum is used in a um, more efficient way. Actually, you could further think, okay, why not put more absorbers, have infinity of absorbers and so on, and here you just uh, see some some plot from my colleague um, as actually from the 35 department because they have been in the game for quite a long time um, already realizing reliable multi-junctions uh, and having great records um, for triple junction but also for quadruple junction for the concentrator photovoltaic but this year um, focus actually on the silicon based um, multi-junctions now so that's why you have 1.12 electron fixed here and then you see that you can have an increase in uh, efficiency, this is now here in radiative limit, um, based on the number of junctions. But you also can see that actually it's a dual junction, the triple junction, which really gives the, the big benefit and you need to also admit, uh, or also take into consideration that it gets more complex, you have more contact material uh, and you will also face some um, parasitic absorption, so actually we mainly focus on um, tandem at the moment, but also uh, we will start some activities in the triple junction very soon. Well, actually just that. Um, and on the right hand side, of course, the important bit is also which band gap actually we need for a perfect tandem, uh, silicon based uh, perfect tandem. And this is uh, shown here in the radiative limit, it's actually 1.73 electron volts, which would be ideal. However, as I just mentioned, if you go to make the device, you will have more layers which you need. There will be also some parasitic absorption involved, and this then actually literature says like around 1.65 to 1.7. EV, which is optimum for the cross guide. Actually, there's uh, actually also good news because it's high band gap um, uh, compositions. They usually use high fraction of bromide and they are prone to uh, phase stability or phase instability under illumination. Um, and it's even yeah, good news that we can stay with this 1.65 electron volts also because actually at higher temperature where we have the, um, the, uh, them operating in the field, um, it's that the band gap of silicon actually uh, gets smaller, whereas the cross gap band gap is uh, uh, increasing. So we also did some temperature dependent EQE on this, showing this, but there's a nice paper also from Kaus from Erkan ID showing this actually with cross gap silicon tandem in the field. So we are pretty safe with this more stable cross gap composition um, for the use. Also, just to briefly show for those who are not familiar with cross guide, um, here's the ABX3 structure, I won't comment much on it, just that uh, in 2009 it was first employed uh, for photovoltaics. It's well known as a mineral class well before, uh, but the new thing was that we had like inorganic organic compositions now, where we on the A um, cation side can have, for example, methylammonium or form amidinium, also as organic cations within the structure. And um, they are so great as a partner for silicon, as um, yeah, it has a direct band gap, strong absorption, so it can use very thin films. Um, the crystal defects, they actually cause very little harm. Um, also for single junctions, they have been very high um, lab cell uh, efficiency reported, uh, over 25%. Um, also how to produce it, it's quite versatile. You can have wet chemical processing, but also um, vapor 
for a vacuum-based processing, and it can be realized potentially cheap. And this is a big um, advantage compared to 3.5. I mean, it's very reliable, it's used in space. We have also the concentrator photovoltaic um, with very high efficiencies, about, um, I think, 47 point 6% if I'm right, it's just a new record uh, made at Fraunhofer ESA and um, I mean this is just incredible but it's too expensive uh, for really employing in the large scale. So that's the great uh, opportunity here and by combining or changing here the A, B and X side we can actually tune the band cap um, that it perfectly fits for our kind of application and that's why it's such a promising partner. Okay, now then I would like to move on and actually show you some results from our lab. Um, I call it here perovskite silicon lab cells, so this means the small cells where we do, let's say, material development on. Uh, I will focus on these results today. And I would like to start to present you, um, let's say, the baseline, how we work um, at the moment is having a bottom solar cell, which is a silicon heat core junction. Um, cell, then we usually have a thin um, ITO, a recombination layer, and a perovskite top cell processed directly on top. So it's a monolithic device, um, and we have contacts at the bot bottom and at the top. Um, also, right on the just right hand side, next to it, to the sketch, you can see that actually the main bit is silicon, 250 micrometers, and actually just that blue little stripe here, um, here you can see a zoom in, is a top cell less than one micrometer. So this again stresses how little material we actually need to apply here. Um, in this case, we reach 25.1% efficiency with a high band gap absorber, which we at that time thought would be the best. It was like a formidinium cesium um, composition um, here at the A side, um, having a optical backup of 1.68 electron volt, but actually I will now tell you how we proceed uh, proceeded from this. We knew that there are quite some optical losses and that the cell was actually limited by very low or by quite low JSC, and that's why we went into optical modeling. Um, here you can see the EQE measured and simulated uh, in, in blue the perovskite part and uh, in red the silicon part and in green the one minus reflection. And uh, from this state, okay, it's said current, but this was the state there uh, back then, where we actually uh, could uh, understand from simulation that we are very much limited uh, by the photocurrent, by the low photocurrent in the perovskite. Um, as it is uh, in serious co connected uh, device, the, um, the subcell with the lowest uh, photocurrent will determine the overall photocurrent of the tandem device. Um, so of course we wanted, in green here is the perovskite, in red the silicon uh, subcell photocurrent to actually move them to, to the point where we can then, uh, where they meet each other and then actually the tandem uh, current is then uh, increased. So we put up this, uh, let's say, roadmap guided by simulation to uh, yeah, put certain measures uh, to improve the device, which were mainly a thinner uh, recombination ITO, a thicker perovskite, a uh, uh, fine-tuned band gap, and a less uh, absorbing front TCO. And with this, we can also then estimate, okay, that we also have an efficiency increase by just assuming a certain voltage at maximum power point. But we also see that actually a big jump will then also happen if we go to actually fully textured tunnel devices, but I will later on also comment on this. So now I would like to show you how we actually then went to processing to realize this. So the first step was easy, it was just thinning it down the ITO recombination layer and you can directly see the effect when going to from this 80 nanometer ITO to uh, yeah, down to 5 nanometer, but you can see that already with 20 nanometer we have a much better um, EQE for the silicon. Um, further, uh, we optimized the front TCO with um, investigating more transparent uh, TCOs. Uh, one example is G2 
just our optimization on indium tin oxide, where we then implemented a oxygen, a higher oxygen flow, and this um, actually makes the, the TO or the ITO more, more transparent. But we actually decided to first have a kind of a gradient, a gradient of oxygen within the within the stack, which gave us the best uh, results and um, the best contact also to the to the tin oxide underneath. And with this, we could already improve the JSC of the tandem device by around 1 milliamps per square centimeter. Further, we investigated the different perovskite compositions. Um, as I mentioned, we started with this form of medium cesium composition uh, with a bank of around 1.68 electron volts, and then wanted to decrease it a bit down and fine tune it. However, we found that the quality was much better for this lower band gap politics. 1.64 electron uh, band gap compositions when introducing a small amount also of methyl ammonium. There's also quite some literature on, on these uh, compositions and we found yeah, that they actually work better for us. So this is what we call triple cation absorbers. So on the A side, we actually now have cesium, methyl ammonium, formalidinium, all mixed together. But actually what gave us the tuning of the band gap um, was just reducing of the bromide. So we actually have uh, less bromide, more iodine on this uh, X position. Um, and yeah, this is well known in ProScan to tune the band gap. So on the left hand side you can see the XRD data that it yeah, nicely worked to shift uh, the lattice constant um, by introducing the larger iodine or more fraction of the larger iodine. Um, we could also in a, yeah, change the optical band gap, which we see from the tau plot from reflection transmission data. And actually, we always probe also our um, absorbers by photoluminescence um, um, because, especially this iodine bromine mixture, they tend to also decompose into iodine rich and bromine rich phases. And this, of course, we don't want in our <laughs> application that we put it under the sun and then actually the, we have a phase shift and our material is not stable. But um, yeah, this is even for the higher band gap ones, uh, not a problem as we worked a lot of it, uh, on it to fine tune it um, and to be stable. So uh, this was also not a problem here in this case. So we went down until 1.6 for electron volts by compositional engineering. Um, furthermore, we needed a bit thicker uh, absorber. This we managed by just increasing the molarity from 1.1 molar to 1.2 molar and uh, to reach this, um, let's say, recommended 460 uh, nanometer thickness of, of the proscat layer. We further then implemented these layers also on tandem devices um, and here you nicely see the, that the, yeah, the onset of the perovskite um, yeah, shifts uh, uh, to what we also have seen in the single layers. And we actually can yeah, push the JC and, and to maximize it to 19.6 milliamps per square centimeter. These are all also certified results from Frauen for Color. Um, so they are reliable and actually very much matching our results. So that was also good news. <laughs> And um, yeah, so here we could further improve our JC from 8.5 to 19.6 milliamps per square centimeter by moving and fine tuning the thickness <coughs> and the band gap of the Provsky layer. And yeah, this is also great news as it's good agreement with our simulation and actually one of the top current values for a Provsky silicon tandem solar cells with a planar front. Yeah, we can further. Um, Analyze this uh, very well, actually, which subcell is uh, limiting by the so called spectral metric analysis. Um, so, this is also very well known from 3.5 um, multi junctions. So, what you do is that you uh, do IV measurements, but you actually, uh, okay, you also measure under your standard test condition, which is actually here at this, uh, this, uh, this point here. And then you also tune your spectrum to the red ridge and the blue ridge part and perform IV measurements at each condition. And by this, uh, you can like, derive these kind of plots. You can actually also do this for fill factor, VOC, and uh, efficiency, of course. I just highlighted now again the current. Um, and from this, you can see that uh, you will find here uh, yeah, where the JC is maximum, maximum here at this point. Um, 
And in the end, yeah, with this old reference, you see that actually it was reached under a blue ridge spectrum. This means that actually uh, the perovskite under standard test condition, when you're here, is limiting. And if you like give a bit more in the blue, uh, you can go to this current matching point. Um, by our measures of, of tuning the band gap and the and all what I presented before, we actually now hit the sweet spot just right under standard test condition. Still, we were not very happy because we couldn't really improve the efficiency much more. Um, this also goes with, yeah, you need to know in the spectrometric uh, analysis, you will also see that actually the fill factor is lowest when you are actually at current matching point. So the fill factor went down, went down, unfortunately, the JC went up, so we didn't really improve the efficiency too much. So we really wanted to improve uh, uh, the, the fill factor, but also the VOC in general of our devices after now really focusing on the JC. So here it's well known that actually the interfaces uh, to the ProScale play an important role and that we need to work on the contact material. So we switched here to the from the PTAA, which I've shown before, which is an organic polymer, to uh, these cell assembling monolayers, um, which are now also commercially available. Um, so it's here abbreviated with two packs. And uh, this actually worked best for us. And implementing this in the optimal structure, we can further we could further improve the fill factor of our device. I mean, it's just a, it's not really a mono layer because there might be also some molecules on top. But to say it's very thin and um, allows a very good contact. Um, and with this, we reach 26.8% uh, efficiency. Again, it's certified values from form for color. Um, so we were actually happy about improving, uh, but still, I mean, we can do better, especially the VOC, uh, if you consider 730 uh, millivolts from the bottom solar cells, the, the top cell should, should deliver more than this. Um, for this reason, we wanted to understand actually where we do have our, our, all our VOC <coughs> losses in the top cell, and this we can um, yeah, investigate by using PL quantum yield analysis. So we measure absolute PL. Um, here we did a study where we investigated um, the perovskite <coughs> process on top of silicon and different whole transport material. And you can see that uh, from the PLQI, you can derive the quasi thermal level splitting or the internal voltage uh, of your absorber. And um, here we can see that yeah, going from PTAA to the self-assembling monolayers, here are just two different uh, plotted, uh, we can actually have this benefit of yeah, around 50 millivolts. And this is very much into like, comparable to what was uh, presented by Ala Shuri when introducing the self-assembling monolayers. However, as soon as we put the C60 on top, actually the PL is scratched. And actually, this is very much uh, limiting our internal voltage, as you can see. So um, we now know where our main loss come from, um, or one of the main loss at least. And uh, that's why we're at the moment working on putting here some passivation layer uh, in between the perovskite and the C60 to improve this. It's just ongoing work. And yeah, it seems promising. And I mean, also in literature, there's a lot of it uh, at the moment uh, being discussed and worked on. Also, just a little preview. Um, also, my colleague Christoph Messmer, who yeah, does the, the main part of the simulation, um, of course, further developed uh, the model from an only optical model to a full optoelectrical model. Because as we have seen before, JSC is not the only thing we need to improve to get high efficiency. So, um, and we also want to uh, also understand, uh, gain some more understanding of the charge carrier extraction in our devices. And especially these differences between IVOC and then VOC, where does all the losses come from? Um, we now want to uh, learn in more detail. We will present this in, in Milan, in Milano this year at the World Conference. Um, and just to let you know that, of course, this is now the next plan to derive a roadmap for VOC and fill factor also based on that. And um, we can also see that actually 30% is well feasible for, for also planar front devices. However, we still want to go to textured devices as also in the module and in the field, it makes very much sense as I will now present in the next uh, part of the talk. So now I will focus 
on the fully textured tandem, which is which we think uh, makes very much much sense. But then we this means that we need to change all the deposition methods and transfer it to this micrometer sized textures. So you need to keep in mind the whole process set is just one micrometer, so it's really challenging to adapt it. So why to do this? Um, one reason is that we still have 3.7 mm per square centimeter loss of reflection at this planar front. And moving to a fully textured tandem device enables yeah, lower reflection losses, um, yeah, just because we have multiple interaction of light and surface. And uh, we also performed some years ago um, a energy yield prediction for modules and saw that actually, yeah, it, it's not very surprisingly, but it, it, it we benefit if we if we have the text string and the higher current uh, generation. But also actually, it um, helped to get rid of this uh, current mismatch situation, which we can have in so different uh, um, angles of incident of light. So there are some good motivation why to do it. Uh, so we went to the lab and tried it out. If you just apply the wet chemical standard route, it looks like this. You will have the, the spikes, the pyramids uh, looking out of your perovskite layer. So this doesn't go to give a conformal film and won't give a good solar cell. So that's why back then we moved to the two-step hybrid route, evaporating in the first step, co-evaporating the inorganic components of the material, and in the second step, adding the organic components. And this is much easier as evaporating the whole perovskite is quite tricky because these organic components, they actually yeah, are very hard to control. And um, in this way, we can still have the flexibility also of of choosing the compositions we like. I will just show in the next slide. So the whole trick about it is that you evaporate first this inorganic scaffold, which conformally coats. Um, and in the second step, you can introduce the organics from solution. It infiltrates the, the scaffold. And after some annealing, you will have a nice uh, thin film covering the whole textures. Another benefit um, yeah, with having this two-step is actually that you're quite flexible in the in tuning the band gap. And uh, this is just yeah, a rather older story, but I think it or older results, but it nicely show um, how we can just tune, for example, in this case, from formaluminium bromide 100% to formaluminium iodide 100%. Uh, and yeah, by um, having the systematic variation in the in the ratio, we can go from, what was it here, I think 1.53 um, electron volts up to 1.75 electron volts. And you can see here with uh, the optical data and also the structural data that you have like a continuous shift there. And you can have really, for example, I don't know, choose a certain ratio and get a, a certain band gap. We also wanted to understand the crystallization of this yeah, quite complex um, um, formation because yeah we already have a scaffold it needs to infiltrate well what is actually happening it was always a bit difficult um, for us to fully understand and I think the kinetics are also not fully fully understand yet or looked at um, but this is like the first attempt we did with uh, in situ XRD where we actually took the films after spin coating put it into in a also closed chamber so it doesn't see the environment um, mounted in the XRD and then actually perform, for example, in this case, at a certain relative humidity, but we also performed it on the nitrogen um, and put it on a temperature stage uh, and just watched what is happening uh, with, with, with our XRD tool. And for example, we could see that already uh, when we start, we have this, so this is really at starting phase, and here you see kind of the XRD plotted in a row. Um, at the very beginning, we mainly have like a solvent phase already, which is present. And then this is here the perovskite main peak. Um, you see that after a while and after heating up, um, actually we go to this nucleation phase and then the crystal grows. And in the end, you see that actually if you go to higher temperatures, there's again uh, like iodide arising, which means that actually the perovskite is decomposing again. And um, this really helped us also to see that humidity actually accelerates the perovskite formation. 
and that actually, for example, annealing in air could uh, always give, uh, gave us better devices, and we were not sure really what is happening there. And um, actually, now we can a bit like have more ideas how we under in which conditions we actually should 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 anneal our samples or or build our devices. And it seems that yeah, this, there's also a kind of solvent phase assisted uh, reaction going on which accelerates uh, the foresky formation and of course we could with this uh, knowledge we can also of course manipulate now um, in a controlled way our crystallization and furthermore we saw that also higher temperatures in this food actually uh, are very much favorable um, as we have uh, get larger grain sizes and sometimes in this uh, evaporation woods or hybrid woods it's uh, let's say they are usually much lower than the um, usual wet in the wet chemical food. So now I will again make a jump to simulation. Um, so we wanted also to understand uh, actually, yeah, which band gap do we need now? Um, which is, what is the optimum? So we kind of um, kind of designed or put a sketch with also including the material we want to use and. Um, simulated them in a, in a, again an optical modeling and derived from this the thickness and uh, the band gap of 1.665 okay let's say 1.66 electron volts um, which is uh, optimum uh, so we current match this device um, and uh, here we can see that we can uh, in the optimal way get 90.7 milliamps per square centimeter this is now lower what you've seen before but this is due to the module case we are now looking at. So we went one step further to really look, okay, what is the actual situation in the module, because this is the situation we want to optimize everything and work with. Um, interesting also was that we have some major losses in the C60 front layer here, the contact. Uh, we saw before that C60 is actually making trouble with the PL being quenched. Here also optically, it's not the best uh, material to use so every one of you working on uh, alternative material, I think C60 is really something we need to get rid of or thin it down, replace. So I highly encourage um, all the students also. There's really something, it's really a bottleneck because more or less everyone is using it uh, in the PIN structure at the moment. Yeah, I talked about this already. So I can switch just as a last point. I want to say, of course, you can also flip the whole polarity and go for NRP structures. In the tandem world now, it has all shifted more or less to PIN. There are few still also actually with in the last years showing uh, quite promising results again. But um, yeah, also here we can see just by putting the C60 then behind the prof guide also improves the situation. We can increase the um, the current matching uh, or the current the tandem current we expect here. And actually, we can also thin and down. We get this result even by thinning and down the perovskite. So this means also all the work on charge transport material is also very important, and we should not neglect that this is of course a big part also in um, yeah to get uh, high efficient devices. And also with the spiro TTB, we actually are a bit more flexible because only uh, 0.09 milliamps per square centimeter loss we have uh, with increasing the thickness around five uh, nanometer. And before. Um, in the case of um, C60, this was uh, more than four times higher. It's very much if you increase the thickness, you will directly see quite some impact on your tangents. Yeah, and with this, I'd just like to summarize and to motivate uh, how important and uh, nice it can be to bring simulation processing and characterization together. I think this is the only way how it works, and we usually have yeah need to do several iterations to really. Um, proceed. Uh, with this we could reach this 90.6 milliamps per square centimeter with a planar front. Um, also this 26.8% certified stabilized efficiency. Uh, we know now where our uh, limitation is at and of course we're now working on it and trying to improve also on our simulation in, uh, yeah, in the full optoelectrical uh, model to actually give us some new hints and guidelines and insights. Um, further, I showed you some um, results of fully textured tandem uh, roadmap and um, actually how uh, also the modeling can help to give the guidelines for the processing. Um, just as a, um, also to, to let you know, we just uh, built up in the last year uh, some 
yeah, so new perovskite silicon processing labs to actually be able also to scale up. Um, so we have four glove box for wet chemical processing and four for vacuum processing. We're also participating in the EU project called Viper Lab, where we also uh, share our infrastructure with people from abroad. They can write a short proposal and visit us. I think that's also a great opportunity just to share infrastructure because it's quite complex. It's worth a lot of work to, <laughs> to build this up. Um, and of course now, which yeah, today I didn't talk about, we actually not only have the Perosi lab, but also the Perosi scale, uh, which focuses on uh, the wafer-based processing of two terminal and cross silicon tandem devices. And with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you so much for a great presentation and kind of a roadmap. Um, are there questions? I'm, I'm curious how you uh, solved the decomposition uh, problem yeah, because you have uh, you, you do have uh, bromine iodine mixtures, mm -hmm. uh, so and you go uh, up to uh, 1.65 electron volts and you need a mixture. Nevertheless, you don't see any uh, um, demixing, or even in the lines, mm -hmm. is it because they are very pure the crystals or. Uh, so actually it's also known that um, lower bromine contents that don't really show this effect, it's usually starting with about 1.68 electron volts, it okay, so can get very severe. So that's what I said, like actually we are quite lucky that actually this optimum is shifting down and down uh, with the more experience and knowledge we are gaining. So this is a good part about it, uh, but actually there are also some uh, really, um, let's say, scientific bits uh, to take into consideration. So for example, for the high band gap, uh, perovskites uh, containing more or in this let's say critical range um, for example one approach which we did is uh, to in incorporate more of the uh, cesium cation and to play with the composition because actually when you go and um, kind of tilt uh, the octahedras uh, in the structure um, they are actually less prone so you kind of induce a certain strain inside the crystal by having smaller cations, for example, introduced. And uh, this actually uh, helps to uh, improve the photostability. So we optimize, or this was our approach for these compositions, to optimize the CD Because the control. barrier for halides migration becomes higher. Yeah. So um, yeah, it's also a bit like inducing. I think there's some nice book from Bruno also, I think as uh, what she presented at HLPV, that also pressure can uh, reduce uh, the yeah. I'm, I'm aware of that. Okay, good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so uh, what was the percentage of bromine that you were using then uh, to, to get to uh, 1.65? I think the 1.64 now has only 17 percent bromine. Oh, yes. So very okay, low. And they are on the safe side. Yeah, yeah, they are on the safe side. So that's what I said. So the other ones, they anyway, they are on the safe side. Just actually, it was quite some work to actually have the, the one which I showed in the very beginning. That was a tough one, but. <laughs> yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have a question on the materials part. Uh, when you talk about the conformal deposition, there was a. I had the impression first you start like with some crystallized when you evaporate that are uh, not conformal, and then when you put uh, the rest of them, the solution they get conformal. What is the mechanism? How do things rearrange? Yeah. So at the beginning, it's mainly lead iodide. It can also like form these platelets. Actually, to be honest. If we do this now, so this was quite a bit older, older image, but uh, if we do this now, it's more compact. We cannot really explain. It also maybe depends even on um, the supplier of the material. Actually, there was a little crisis some years ago with fully evaporated guide when TCI, the, the main supplier, changed the, the way of how they produce the lead iodide and actually how pure it is and so on, and it messed up the crystallization completely. So it's, it's very sensitive. Um, but yeah, in general, we in the beginning, especially with the pyramids, they form this, let's say, more porous structure, the lead iodide, and actually then the solution infiltrates uh, by spin coating, but for the upscaling it can be also spray coating, for example, and it's really then just that uh, it retains a certain amount of the solution, and then on the hot plate it reacts, and I mean the volume also increases uh, 
as we have this reaction to, to the proskite phase, and then it forms a layer. But it's very crucial, actually, to have the right amount of solution, to have the right concentration. Um, I mean, this is really key, also how thick the scaffold at the beginning is, that you really fine-tune this, that kind of you have a um, full conversion and not end up with remnant that iodide, for example, in the structure. The driving force is capillarity that drives everything to the interface of the pyramid, or? Yes, we think so, because it also, um, yeah, it, it's, it's really conformal. So also, if we perform XPS, for example, of the composition, and, and, and uh, it's, it looks good, it looks homogeneous, but it needs to be fine-tuned, as I said, because if there's the wrong ratio, um, then it doesn't work out. Interesting, thanks. So we're out of time, unfortunately, but uh, so post the coffee break, and then you can discuss further. Thanks again. Okay.